Okay, well, <clears throat> nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. There's really so much to cover and so little time, so I'm going to just dive right in. Too many greenhouse gases and land use changes certainly contribute somewhat a little to global temperatures and air and moisture patterns and other aspects of still predominantly natural climate change and weather. However, actual hurricane, tornado, drought, and other data do not support the idea that humanity and planet face a man-made climate disaster. But let's assume, for the sake of argument, that there is a crisis. How might we avert it? The most proffered and preferred solution is always banning fossil fuels and switching to wind and solar power, with no new hydroelectric power or nuclear power. The United States and other developed nations must lead in this effort. We're told and other countries will assuredly follow us in this transition to renewable energy. The proposition raises two very important fundamental questions. First, will it work? Can those acceptable renewable energy sources actually power modern industrialized societies, health and living standards? I'd say that Britain and Europe are proving right now that wind and solar cannot do it. They cannot provide sufficient, reliable, affordable energy to power modern economies and keep people from dying from illnesses and pre-existing health conditions that they would easily survive if skyrocketing energy prices didn't force so many poor families and pensioners to keep their homes so cold. Wintertime solar is always minimal in much of Europe and North America. And for months now, Europe's and Britain's wind turbines have been operating at barely 15% of nameplate capacity. That works out to three hours a day, 25 hours a week, 100 hours a month, in spurts at totally random, unpredictable times. This lack of wind and solar power has sent heating and electricity prices into the stratosphere. Millions of families over there are in fuel poverty, Millions of workers have gone jobless. Entire industries are disappearing. Tens of thousands of people will literally die this winter who would have survived if they hadn't had to keep their homes so cold, so fracking cold. And let's not forget last winter's blizzard that clobbered Texas and the Midwest and caused a near total failure of the renewable energy electricity system. The grid collapsed when it was needed most, leaving millions of people without heat. Over 100 people died. Second, and the focus of my talk, are these renewable energy sources actually renewable? Are they clean, green, and sustainable, ecological? Remember Milton Friedman's remark, his basic rule, there's no free lunch. Wind and sunshine are absolutely clean, green, renewable, and sustainable. However, harnessing wind and sunshine to meet modern energy needs absolutely is not. Wind turbines, solar panels, electric vehicles, and backup battery systems are simply not clean, green, ecological, renewable, or sustainable. You could say they are all that here in the USA where they're installed if you ignore their huge impacts on scenery, habitats, wildlife, the health and of people living near wind turbines and other harmful effects. But when you look at the total life cycle of wind, solar and battery power, those energy sources merely move the location of the dirty work, the air and water pollution, the greenhouse gas emissions, the even worse impacts on wildlife habitats, wildlife and people. Those impacts may be very far away from us, but they're very real and we cannot afford to ignore them. In fact, Dartmouth's own sustainability mission and value statement says, we need to focus on the big picture of global sustainability. We need to recognize that sustainability problems are systemic and multifaceted, that they impact people and planet and wildlife around the world in disparate and disproportionate ways. And I fully agree with that. My background, by the way, is geology and field ecology, 
I'm back in 1970, this is going to date me very quickly. When I was a senior in college, I organized the very first Earth Day on my college campus. So I've been involved in these issues for a long, long time. We also have to remember fossil fuels built the United States and modern industrialized developed world. They're still the foundation of our industries, technologies, jobs, living standards, revenues, consumer goods, our healthcare, our agriculture, and countless other social, economic, and environmental benefits. They still account for over 80% of America's and the world's total energy. Natural gas is also a vital feedstock for agricultural fertilizers to help us grow more crops on less land. To suggest that fossil fuels can or will disappear over the next 30 years or so and be replaced with wind and solar power and batteries is sheer fantasy. It bears repeating, wind and sunlight are definitely clean and renewable and sustainable, but harnessing their highly dispersed, unpredictable, unreliable, weather-dependent energy to meet humanity's very huge and growing energy needs absolutely is not. Harnessing wind and sunlight requires vast expanses of land and sea coasts. It requires still more land to mine and process and utilize metals and minerals and other raw materials that are anything but renewable using fossil fuels most of the time and methods that are absolutely not clean, green, renewable or sustainable. And yet President Biden and many other folks want the United States to have 80% hydrocarbon free electricity generation by 2030 and 100% by 2035. They want to eliminate all fossil fuel use in all sectors of the US economy by 2050 and worldwide shortly after that. Their Green New Deal requires replacing coal and natural gas for generating electricity, gasoline and diesel for powering vehicles, natural gas for, for smelting and manufacturing, and natural gas for heating and cooking and water heating in our homes, our businesses, our, our hospitals and our schools. Together, this would mean America's annual electricity requirement would skyrocket from about 2.7 billion megawatt hours per year today. That's the fossil fuel portion of, uh, of our total US electricity generation to almost 7.5 billion megawatt hours per year in 2050. And again, this is just for the United States. Substantial additional generation would be required to constantly recharge backup batteries so that we can continue functioning as a modern economy, even amid sunless and windless days. It's generally assumed that this fundamental transformation of America's energy, economic, industrial, and social system can be accomplished with rather modest numbers of turbines and solar panels and batteries on rather modest amounts of land. I summarize that assumption as minimal acreage requirements for green infrastructure and conveyance. Conveyance here, of course, means transmission, electricity transmission. It's certainly a mouthful, but it's kind of easy to remember the concept if you look at its acronym, M-A-G-I-C, MAGIC. And actually, it's a perfect acronym because it really would require magic to make it happen. In reality, generating all that electricity without numerous new nuclear and hydroelectric power plants would require tens of thousands of 800 foot tall offshore wind turbines, millions of sm somewhat smaller onshore turbines, billions of photovoltaic solar cells, or some combination of those technologies. Then backing up sufficient nationwide electricity for even one week of windless sunless days would require well over a billion half ton battery modules like the kind you find in a Tesla car. So that blackouts don't shut down our economy, factories and lives. It would mean more turbines and panels to keep the batteries charged up on a constant basis. And then connecting all those facilities 
to electricity dependent communities, industrial centers, and data hubs would require thousands of miles of new underwater and online on land transmission lines. These seem certainly like impossible numbers, way too high, but you have to remember wind and solar generate electricity only 25 to 40 percent perhaps of percent of the year in the best U.S. locations. They generate electricity less than 25 percent of the year on average nationwide. And as I said, less than 15 percent the last four months in Britain and Europe. And the more wind and solar electricity we need, the more we have to put these turbines and panels in much lower quality areas where they might generate power only 10 or 15 or 20 percent of the year. So the point is, the more turbines we need, we, the more we have to put them in less and less desirable areas where they're not going to generate electricity very much at all. And it's going to require far more land if you add it up. And you're talking about hundreds of millions of acres that would be impacted by wind and solar and battery power. It's a huge swath of the continental United States, maybe a quarter, a third, or even more of the lower 48 USA. I'm going to point out one other thing. You see that swath right down the middle where all the purple and the gold is? That's some of the best wind areas in the United States. It's also a migratory fly route for whooping cranes and geese and all these other birds, millions and millions of them that go north and south from Canada to the Gulf Coast every year. And they would be wiped out by hundreds of thousands or millions of wind turbines put in that area where you would want them because that's where the wind is. I'm afraid we don't have time to go into depth at the moment on photovoltaic solar energy, but let's take a look at offshore wind energy. President Biden wants to install 30,000 megawatts of wind power off America's coast by 2030. That's over 2,000 monstrous 850 foot tall 14 megawatt wind turbines. Washington Monument is 650 feet tall or 2,500 slightly smaller 12 megawatt turbines. Each blade is longer than a football field. So that's over enormous amount of wind turbines just to get 30,000 megawatts, which sounds like a lot of power, but even if they operated at full capacity 24 seven, which would never happen, these turbines wouldn't even meet peak summertime electricity needs for New York State, much less the entire United States. And imagine the devastation that a Gulf of Mexico or Atlantic Coast hurricane would wreak on those turbines, and thus on our electricity, our economy, our lives for months or years afterward, because it would take months or more likely many years to replace and repair all those turbines. So even if wind and solar facilities avoided the most sensitive areas, they would still disrupt or destroy scenic areas, wildlife habitats, and croplands. Turbine blades would kill millions of raptors, other birds, and bats. Vibration noise from offshore turbine uh, activity would disrupt whale and dolphin navigation and communication systems. Wind turbine blade movement and the tower vibration would interfere with military and civilian air and sea radar and navigation, as with the sheer presence of these forests of turbines onshore and offshore. Their strobe lights, their light flicker, and infrasound would impair the sleep and health of people living near the turbines. And what about the trash? Solar panels, battery models, modules, and wind turbine blades up to 350 feet long can't be recycled. Toxic metals in the panels and batteries could be leached into soils and groundwater or released into the air during fires, whether it's by accident or when people burn the panels in order to recover the embedded metals. So where will all this trash be dumped? In whose backyards will it go? Where will the industrial scale wind and solar installations go? And where will the landfills go? And who gets to decide? Moreover, these wind 
solar and battery systems wear out rapidly, especially offshore wind turbines because of all the salt spray. And they have to be replaced every 10 or 20 years. So there's more trash, more mining, and we are worried about plastic straws. Still worse, battery modules have a nasty habit of bursting into flames, into infernos that are very hard to extinguish. Imagine that happening with an electric vehicle in your garage or a power wall or whole warehouse filled with these batteries. This brings me to the second critical topic. Where do we get all these wind turbine solar panels, battery modules and transmission lines? It's generally assumed that they will just sort of be there. The metals and minerals and plastics and concrete and other raw materials required to make those technologies will also just kind of be there. My term for this is materials acquisition for global industrial change. And again, you can easily remember that term by its, by its term, by its uh, acronym, MAGIC, M-A-G-I-C. And it really would require magic to pull it off. A recent International Energy Agency report concludes that manufacturing all these fossil fuel replacement technologies would require tens of billions of tons of non-renewable iron and copper, aluminum, cobalt, lithium, nickel, rare earth elements, plastics, concrete, and other raw materials. Getting them would mean mining, crushing, processing, refining, and transporting hundreds of billions of tons of ores from thousands of mines and quarries using gigantic gasoline and diesel powered equipment. These fossil fuel intensive activities often imply, employ hazardous chemicals and release toxic pollutants. They require enormous amounts of water, often in the world's most water deprived areas. They cause acid mine drainage, create mountains of waste rock, generate vast lakes of toxic chemicals from refining the ores. Technologies certainly exist to address all these problems, but they're rarely utilized in these overseas operations because laws governing these operations are well below US, European, and Canadian standards if they exist at all. Wind, solar, battery, and electric vehicle technologies actually require far more metals and minerals than their fossil fuel counterparts. The IEA says electric cars require three times more copper than gasoline modules, models. Onshore wind turbines need nine times more copper, concrete, steel, and other materials per megawatt of electricity generated than a modern combined cycle gas fire generating plant. Just one three megawatt wind turbine like this one that's being installed on a West Virginia mountaintop requires 600 cubic yards, that's 1,500 tons of concrete, plus all that rebar you see there. Offshore wind turbines require 14 times more materials per megawatt. So just that initial Joe Biden offshore wind turbine, 30,000 megawatts. New York State summertime peak electricity needs just that program will require almost 110,000 tons of copper, plus millions of tons of other materials. At an average of 0.44% of copper in all types of copper ore deposits around the world today, that means just those first 2,100 offshore wind turbines would require mining, crushing, and processing 25 million tons of copper ore. And that's after removing some 40 million tons of overlying rock or overburden just to get to the ore bodies. Add in materials for solar panels, additional wind turbines, backup battery systems, subsea electrical cables, onshore transmission lines, electric vehicles, electric ovens and heating systems in your homes, and other green technology to run the entire United States. And again, this is just the USA and the green energy transformation would require tens of billions of tons of metals and minerals, trillions of tons of ores, 
trillions of tons of overburden and thousands of mines, processing plants and factories with virtually all that work done using fossil fuels. America's Green New Deal would require raw materials in excess of the entire world's current and foreseeable mining and processing capabilities. A global Green New Deal would probably require mining our entire solar system. So where will all these raw materials actually come from? Well, it's often assumed or more accurately expected that the United States can simply outsource all this mining and processing without compromising our economic or national security or our commitment to sustainability, environmental protection, and human rights. I don't have a cool acronym for that, but it would require a lot more magic. The United States permits very little mining for the metals and minerals that are essential for modern industrialized civilization and for the energy transformation that President Biden, AOC, Al Gore, and other, maybe some folks in this room might demand. And even worse, even the most ardent Green New Deal proponents have made it clear that they won't tolerate more mining here in the USA, even for this economic and industrial energy transformation. They intend to have nearly all Green New Deal metals and minerals extracted overseas, often by Chinese companies, which, is, which also control the processing of many minerals that are mined in Africa and Asia and Latin America, and the manufacturing of increasing numbers of wind turbine solar panels and batteries. China and many of those other foreign suppliers rarely apply anything approaching U.S. laws and standards for environmental protection, pollution control, mine land reclamation, workplace safety, fair wages, child and slave labor, and other basic human rights. Activists demand this for clothing and coffee, but never for green energy. So even as we meet here right now this evening, 40,000 children as young as four years old are already laboring with their parents in Democratic Republic of Congo cobalt mines for a few dollars a day under constant threat of cave-ins and with constant exposure to toxic and radioactive air and mud and dust and water just to meet today's cobalt needs for cell phone, laptop and electric vehicle batteries. These cobalt needs would skyrocket under any Green New Deal, even just a US Green New Deal. The cobalt ore is sent to China for processing in plants with equally abominable safety and pollution conditions and controls. Air and water pollution from the plants has been linked to alarming cancer, blood disease, and other health problems. Air pollution and an enormous toxic waste dump for effluents from rare earth mining and processing in China's Inner Mongolia region have destroyed agriculture and created similar health issues for plant workers and local residents. China also uses Uyghur slave labor to manufacture solar panels that are sold to the United States. From my perspective, this is not responsible outsourcing. And here's another vitally important question. Will anyone really follow America's Green New Deal leadership? We're often told that other countries will follow our lead and rapidly eliminate their fossil fuels to prevent global warming catastrophes. It's a nice theory. But in reality, China, India, and countless really poor countries are doing nothing of the sort. In fact, they're rapidly increasing their carbon-based fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions. First of all, their people are determined to take their God-given places among Earth's healthy and prosperous people. And even today, in sub-Saharan Africa, 600 million people, twice the population of the United States, have no access to electricity for lighting, heating, air conditioning, refrigeration, television, modern hospitals and schools, businesses, factories, and jobs. Another 300 million people enjoy the blessings of electricity, an average of one hour a day, eight hours a week, 410 hours a year, at totally unpredictable times for a few minutes, hours, or days at a time. Could any of us in this room live that way? Indoor air pollution 
from burning wood and animal dung to cook and to heat homes at night, causes 4 million deaths per year just in Africa. I firmly believe their black lives matter as well. Millions in Asia and Latin America face similar energy deprivation, poverty, and needless death. That's one reason there will be far more coal mining, oil and natural gas drilling, coal and gas fueled electricity generation for decades to come. And second, those countries are also using fossil fuels to conduct the mining, processing, and manufacturing that America refuses to do but are essential for the Green New Deal transformations. This work just can't be done without fossil fuels. That means any American energy transformation will simply transfer emissions sources, emissions and other ecological impacts from the United States to these other countries. And that means even if the United States completely eliminated its fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions, there would be no global climate or emission benefits from doing so. In fact, emissions globally would continue going up, up, up. And finally, that means even if plant fertilizing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases actually do drive climate change, there would be no climate benefits. Zero, zip, nada, nichivo, or as you would say in Mandarin, mayo. In fact, over the last decade, the United States signif significantly reduced its carbon dioxide emissions, largely by replacing coal-fired electricity generation with gas-fired power plants. But meantime, in 2020 alone, China put 38,000 megawatts of new coal-fired power plants into operation. Beijing is also building planning or financing more than 300 coal-fired power plants in Turkey, Vietnam, Indonesia, and other nations. Germany and Japan have been building new coal-fired generators. African countries are planning to build more than 1,250 new coal and gas-fired generating units by 2030 or so. Many of them are being financed by Chinese banks and built by Chinese companies. In addition to the reasons I already outlined, that's because woke US, EU, and international banks and companies refuse to finance or build fossil fuel projects. They say it wouldn't be moral or ethical or socially responsible or climate friendly to enable and encourage more fossil fuel use. They will only build wind, solar, battery, and biofuel facilities. Of course, that means forcing poor countries to accept whatever low living standards can be supported by expensive, inadequate, unreliable, weather-dependent, pseudo-renewable energy. Excuse me now for being pretty blunt, but according to this twisted logic, perpetuating energy deprivation, unemployment, adject poverty, bacteria-infested water, polluted air, substandard hospitals, rampant disease, and early death in poor countries is somehow moral and ethical and socially responsible according to these ideas because it's for the greater planetary good. No, it's not. It's carbon colonialism and eco-imperialism, energy and economic apartheid, manslaughter by energy and climate policy and systemic systematic racism. Developing countries won't stand for it anymore. And I think they made that pretty clear with the way they walked out of the COP26 without any real agreement on their part. They have their priorities right, I think, and I applaud them. I stand up for their position. People come first. Well, there's a lot more we could talk about, but we're out of time. So let's just go into the Q&A, but I hope you'll think about all these things and ask your professors about this, delve into these topics as homework assignments or your own uh, examination of sustainability and renewable energy presets. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah.